Okay, no, I just want to see it. You get to keep it. No, it's it's actually asking for some feedback because okay. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, come to the trip class. I'll go get some black plastic so you guys really can understand. I, I I I know there's something to it. I'm sure it's doable, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's so hard to really teach on Zoom, especially a class that's got a little more hands-on component to it. You're doing great. So it's it's very, very interesting. Um it's just something I've never done before. Okay. Do you vegetable garden at all? I've grown squash and rhubarb and strawberries for the last probably five years all in a row, which is why I don't get much yield. I had no idea to rotate. So, well, with the rhubarb, it's time to rotate. Yeah, it's there. I don't know what to do. And then the strawberries, they're fine too. Yeah. Yeah, and then the kids and mothers uh, live that day on Sunday for Saturday. Mm -hmm. So the last months of the mothers. Oh, yeah. Everybody, everybody wants. Yeah. yeah. So when you do the vegetable garden, there's your main line, and here's your drip coming off of it. But, and your drip is every eight inches. So. Which is on the center. And you can put plant here and plant there and plant there and like that. Yeah. And so you can you can pack a lot more in. And I just dead end everything. I just tie that off. But with that square footage, you have to have several good ones. Okay. Yeah, you figure out what, you know, like 20 by 25, something. And then you figure out, you know, one rectangle, one long, you know, or however you want to configure it. And then you figure out what your, you know, your water is first coming in. How about it? One to it. Yeah, so if you got 20 by the 20 by, you're going to have 25 lines. Well, not necessarily. So if this is, I mean, here's your filter and your pressure regulator. And then there's your line. And then and 12 inches. I'm not going to use all of these all the time. So if this is, say this is 20 feet, I have 18, maybe 17 in here. But I may have, I may not even use that one this year. I may just clean this out. I got 24 inches between my beds. So I'm going to be a little bit in between. Mm -hmm. But um, does your seed kind of stuff that you're talking about? Uh, For a vegetable garden, I would just mulch it and call it good. I wouldn't go in here and just let it down. Okay. Yeah, but you want to cure it. Actually, you prefer it. It's my God. No, but you can prepare it. All the carrots, all the ones that are yeah, and then let us over here. In these, but I just, I just, I shove everything in there. I cry my time. Okay. No, I push and yield. So, what it's all about, right? Yeah. I want it to get real bad. And I want to, I'll freeze or dry or can or wet or can or yeah, 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 Center. So I may put tomato plant here in the middle, 
Well, you have you have a fancy program on your computer or something. No. That was free for seven days. So I took advantage of it. The life where you put your your flowers, your pollinator attracting. Yeah, but I left out my mirror. Just a little bit. It was expensive. Oh, this is nice. 
Yeah. 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 I kept looking for corn dogs. But like, yeah, I tried looking at the vacancy. Is it? Uh, looking for bacon. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I found that. I was just looking online and I found that farmer's on that and said, you can try it for seven days. That's pretty cool. That, that works out pretty slick as far as doing a, a garden layout. That's really nice. Yeah, it's got a whole list of plants and flowers and everything. Oh, just pick it and drag. And yeah, are you Nice. That's that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Mine does not look well. This Sunday afternoon, I'm never going to get this done. <laughs> and I just ran, I don't know how I ran across it. I was just looking for garden examples. Into that one. Oh, great. Be nice. And they're color coded, so you know when they're wrote. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's yeah, that's my pet. That's a nice plan to use. I just I just sketch it out on a piece of paper, and I know when it has to read it. yourself um, I understand that you're going to set us up for something so that we can record our hours on the app and something yeah as soon as I get you guys loaded onto the online system okay which is what I'm going to start I'm going to have one of the admins do that for me and then um, you guys can start logging Yes, I'm shocked that I don't have my whole back in for tonight. I'm still working on the other one. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to be able to be shown until So, um, as long as you get a head for that, sure. and then I'll watch the Zoom. So I wasn't sure if it was anything, but it's exciting what's going to happen on this. I think it's the Prairie Ecology class. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's the right hand.
Okay, so I'm waiting for the speaker, which is supposed to be Tim Parker tonight. So I'm going to quick check my emails to make sure he has an email again. And I didn't catch it. Oh, we have that one. Well, he did call it just you know, they got the plants going out and the legit around you know, water for them. Yeah. 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 I told him that I never saw him up and fire off that one. So our speaker tonight was supposed to be Kim Parker on perennials annuals and 
it's kind of a fun flower program. And so I'm not sure where she's at, but in the meantime, Yeah. Oh, seriously. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's fun. Any day with a Y, stuff can happen. Any day. And and the admins assured me that everything was going to work just fine flawlessly tonight. <laughs> Hey, Catherine, try clicking enable content. Uh, I'm not sure why it's I'm not sure why it's stuck. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute here. Let's see. Okay, so I'm not sure what happened to Kim Parker. <laughs> Talked, I was emailing her all last week and then I am um, emailed her this morning. So I hope she's okay. She has a little 13 year old. So, teenager. Brad, could you give a talk? What's your topic? Brad, I'll come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's you why. Microphone. Yeah, that's why I carry. Um, the jump drive with me because I, I can give a talk almost any place with that thing. Yeah. Okay. I Julie, I'm not sure how to make that go away at this point. So they can see my see the notes. In other words, they can see the next slide, but that's okay. On the top, click on display settings and do a swap. It disappeared, but I'm not sure where it went to, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. All right, so we're gonna jump ahead a week. Okay, now we can see it from this side, but that's okay. <laughs> it all it's all good, right? Yeah. Catherine, if you you can put it back the way it was, you just have to stop screen share and then restart screen share and make sure you're telling it to share the right screen. That happens often if you start screen share before before um, you start slideshow. 
I think we'll live. <laughs> okay, so, so I'm going to switch topics and we're going to talk about the prairie tonight instead of fun, the fun, fun flowers. And so I live out on the prairie. I've been out there for 24 years. I kind of, I kind of understanding it, but not a whole lot as much as I'd like to. How many of you guys, how many of y'all live out on the prairie? Is anyone out in the county? Okay, there's some, the prairie is just so vastly different from in town and people that move from in town to out of town have a tendency to treat the prairie the same way they did their bluegrass lawn. And the prairie is a whole different creature. And so we'll talk, we'll talk about why and how that's so much different. Okay, so the word prairie, it's a French word, derived from the French, and means meadow, coined by French explorers and trappers moving into the Western Canada and south of the US during the late 18th century to describe the sea of grass. And we don't quite have that sea of grass anymore, which is, which is more of a pity. Have any of you ever been into the tall grass prairies in in uh, Kansas? Literally, yeah, literally, like this. There's a little bit, there's a few remnants of the tall grass prairie down in Fort Collins. And, and I rode through it years ago on a horse and, and all you could see was my head. It was just, it was just the most amazing thing. Okay, so the grasslands, it's usually a temperate climate, intercontinental, meaning that it's between the oceans, so there isn't any oceans or, or big water around it, relatively flat, maybe rolling. If you go up into the um, sand hills of Nebraska, it's very rolling, very hilly, um, but not dramatically, but that's also another part of our grasslands up there. Some of the other grasslands, and you, I'm sure you've all heard of these, but in South Africa is the savanna. Southern or Central Africa is the savanna. Southern Africa is the veld. Eurasia is the steep. Australia is the lowlands. South America, pampas, and the llanos. And this is where they're located at. Gives you an idea of where the grasslands are at. So how was the prairie created? Mountain development to the west created a rain shadow. Remember we talked about that rain shadow in the site analysis class on how the Rain kind of gets um, hung up on the mountains, doesn't quite make the moisture, doesn't quite make it over to us. Favored the establishment of grass over trees. And of course, every once in a while there was a grass fire which took out the trees. And typically, what took the trees out if they did try to grow was some sort of herbivore, like a bison came along or an antelope or deer came along and ate that tree. <clears throat> So the grass, if there was any fires, the grass recovers very, very quickly where the trees just don't. This is probably what ate all the trees. If there was any trees out there, he enjoyed them. Extended periods of drought. So drought's nothing new to the prairie. Been around since, since the prairie was there. Some years are better than others. Short growing season. Here in Wyoming, of course, we know that it's about 90 days for doing well. So then the prairie is, is further divided into tall grass, mixed or middle grass, and short grass. And we're really more in the short grass prairie, about, about knee high, about knee high, 17, 18 inches, 
maybe in a really good year, a little bit taller, but not by much. And then it's also further divided down by the soil type. So Sand Hills of Nebraska is a good example. And then um, the Blackland Prairie of East Texas, if you've ever been through that part of Texas, I've been through Western Texas a lot. And that's, that's a whole different creature down there too, as far as prairie and grasslands. So here's how it gets mixed. It's um, sorted out visually. We've got the tall grass, which is further east because it gets a lot more moisture, a lot more water. Mixed grasses, so this is kind of a transitional area between tall and short. And then, of course, we're in the short grass prairie. So you described a small portion of Fort Collins you've been to that the grass is tall. And why is that? Is that a why is that? I, I'm not sure why that was there. It it was just very, it was very special to find it and then ride through it. Is it a different variety of grass? Mm -hmm. It is. Yep, it was a totally different variety of grass. I, I'm not sure how it got there or how it's, it must have been just in a perfect microclimate in order to have survived. Yeah. So what's the status of the prairie? Less than 1% of the tall grass prairie remains. So just a tiny, tiny bit of it. There's some areas, you can go to almost any of the states that have prairie in them and find pockets. And it was in Wisconsin a number of years ago. And there's actually a special area that had been set aside just to preserve the tall grass prairie, but it was only like an acre. So it was, it was just this tiny thing. About 24% of the mixed grass prairie is intact, about 18% of the short grass prairie is intact. And I just, every year I seem to watch that number get smaller and smaller as more development happens. So question? Yeah. So if it's 1% of the tall grass prairie, how many states did that cover? Oklahoma, eastern Kansas, eastern Nebraska? Yeah. So there's our tall grass prairie right there. Illinois. A lot Less of tall grass prairie. Hmm? Less than 1% of it? Yeah. Well. Yeah. That's, that's, was its original native range. It doesn't, this graph, this picture doesn't necessarily reflect what's currently left. I'm sure that's a lot smaller and it's probably just little dot, little red dots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this was its original range where it was found. It was all the way up into Canada, all the way down into Texas, out into Indiana, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico. So that's that's what's that's what is its original range. That's not what is currently left today. Okay, so the range, when you look at the prairie, there should be, it should actually be totally covered in some sort of vegetation. You shouldn't see open soil. You know, in an ideal prairie, you shouldn't see open soil. 50% basal cover, I'm talking about grasses. And, and then of course there's forbs, which are native plants, wildflowers. Um, sage brush. And then the soil structure is going to be very shallow, very, very thin organic matter on top. The seed bank is going to be pretty big and it's going to have, have good and bad guys in it, but the seed bank should be there, should be pretty good. So Laramie County, we, we do have some mixed grass prairie mostly short grass prairie in this county. And then, and then, so this is why, you know, tall grass prairie where I was at down in Fort Collins, it was just wetter. And that's what really allowed that, that prairie to be that tall. 
But the, the grass, the ground cover is also a function of how much moisture we get. So the last couple of years we've been in a drought. Last year was awful. We got eight inches of moisture for the whole season. So that's not conducive to growing or covering that soil. So it doesn't recover well at all. A lot of these grasses are sod formers. Some of them are going to be bunch grasses, but the sod formers are going to creep around either by underground rhizomes or by stolons above ground stems. And those bunch grasses, you know, you can't miss them because those are the ones you trip over, right? You rock around on the prairie. Then we have cool versus warm season grasses. So the cool season grasses are referred to as C3 grasses. And they're very active when it's cool out. So, so that means when it's cool, about 45 degrees right there. But when it starts to get over 80 degrees, they, they're going to shut down. So they have a very narrow range, but this is this is the temperature they like. They like it cool up. Bluegrass lawns are a cool season. And so your bluegrass lawns do best when it's cool and comfortable and kind of rainy outside. Same thing with our C3 grasses, our cool season grasses. Then the next grass is your C4 or your warm season grasses. And these are the ones, they're gonna stay dormant like it's warm out. So this is, this is February through June. And then these guys come back, oops, see the threes, come back oh, late September through October. And then your C4 grasses. Eighty degrees and above. So June through September. So these C four grasses are going to be very highly adapted to low water and heat, where the other ones aren't adapted to that. They go dormant. And these C4 grasses really enjoy the heat. <clears throat> About 75% of the grassland biomass is below the surface, which is a huge amount of stored energy. So I'm gonna kind of jump around a little bit with this lecture because the cool season grasses So the grass blade itself is going to grow maybe 10 inches tall. So Joe, can you see this back there? Yeah. Okay. Then it's going to put out a seed head. And as soon as it puts out a seed head, it stops growing. This stops growing. But the, the roots keep on going. Going and going and going. As long as nothing comes around and, and eats it. This will go down a good six feet. So when they say underground biomass, this is what we're talking about. This root system is incredible. Pulls moisture down, pulls moisture down deeper. It pulls soil very efficiently so that you don't have that erosion problems. Where your warm season grasses, these guys, These are curly little guys on the ground, and then they put this stolen out that you trip over. Then they put up a tiny little seed head, tiny little seed head, and they're fairly shallow rooted. So they're just trying to get, capture wherever moisture comes along. So maybe 12 inches, maybe, but this top part is only three inches. So when they talk about putting, people talk about putting in a buffalo 
grass lawn. This is what they're talking about. This grass that only gets about three inches tall puts out a little seed. At the, so it's a, a male plant, a female plant. And the male plant puts out a taller seed head that comes up, up here. It's very feathery. And then the female is down below and you don't really see that as a capsule. So in the turf grass class with Tony Kosky, we talked a little bit about this buffalo grass. Do any of you remember the price he said that buffalo grass was going for last year? It was kind of breathtaking. Yeah, it was it was huge, huge money. It was it was anywhere from 60, and Tony said he found a place where it was selling for a hundred dollars a pound. Very hard to harvest this. You know, when it's only three inches above the ground and the seed you're going after, this right here, you know, there, that's only two inches above the ground. Really hard to get that equipment down that low and collect it. So it's labor intensive. And then it's a capsule, it's a seed capsule. So it's also hard to get that to germinate. And it's much better if you're gonna put in a, blue, um, a buffalo grass lawn, it's much better to buy it as started plugs and do it as plugs in your lawn. Plus, it's growing in popularity, right? And, and demand is going. Up. Yeah, I don't know. It kind of comes and goes. It comes and goes. Um, Kim Parker had a uh, buffalo grass lawn. Got tired of dealing with the weeds because she could never get it dense enough. She finally just ripped it out for a bluegrass lawn. Then. And, and I, I'm much more in favor of bluegrass than I'm trying to do something like this. It's very, very expensive. And you may or may not have success. Well, you've got the good best selling price I see there and for bluegrass, you got six months out of the year instead of- Two? Yeah. Yeah. So for two months out of the year, this is gonna be green and the rest of the time it's gonna be eh, the color of the tabletops here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the other thing with this, and, and I've got some slides in here. But when I do a prairie call and I walk out and I see a lot of a lot of this, the buffalo grass, it tells me that someone has mowed it excessively or grazed it excessively. And so this tells me a story about what's going on and how the prairie is being managed. So if this grass here, your C3 grass, if this gets mowed, and so this, by the way, this stops growing in the middle of May. And I tell people what you see by June 1st is all you're gonna get for the rest of the year. And I see people go out there in, in mid-May and just start mowing the heck out of it. Well, if you mow this, and I'm gonna go over here. So if you mow this C3 grass, this cool season grass, so let's say it's been unmolested for years, it's got this nice seed head up there and, and someone comes by and mows it, takes it down, the corresponding amount of roots dies. So all of a sudden you've got this, that might be three inches tall, you lose all this biomass down here. This just dies off. Well, if you keep coming back, and you mow it again, and, you, and it's and it's trying to put up a seed head, right? Because that's that's its goal in life is to put up seeds, a seed head. And you keep cutting it. This keeps getting shallower and shallower. Now you start to lose grass in between here. Now you've got bare soil. Well, bare soil is is pretty much dead. Microorganisms can't live in there. So nothing's really happening in this in this zone here. This eventually dies. Then you end up with all this little blue, you know, the buffalo grass comes in 
And it's okay because it's holding the soil down. I mean, that's that's important to hold that soil in place. But the urban myths about prairie are got it really wrong. And the urban myths are you've got to mow it so it doesn't catch on fire. Really? So out here, where it's it's gotten to be tall and the roots are deep, it is now shading the soil. And it's starting to get, it'll fill in, you know, it's either right, it's either right a bunch of grass, so it's gonna get denser, lighter, right? Or it's rhizominous and it's gonna pop up and keep popping up. And it's gonna keep filling in. Well, this tall seed head in the, in the, during snowstorms gets blown over, snowed over. And so now it starts laying on the ground. So now you end up with leaf litter and stems and all sorts of stuff down here. So when you use a ground cover, when you put mulch down on the ground, you're trying to hold in soil moisture, right? You know, it's when you talk about putting black plastic down in your vegetable garden, that's holding in the soil moisture. Same thing here. These leaves fall over, the stems fall over, and they're, they're supplying organic material, and they're also ground cover for the soil. And so the soil moisture is going to be higher. Soil moisture is going to be higher. And these seed heads, if you leave them alone, also shade the ground. So the blades of grass are shading the ground, the seed heads are shading the grass. And I can go out onto my prairie and I can, in the August and I can still find green grass. And I can still find moist prairie. Green grass does not burn. I might, if I have a prairie fire, I might get some burn, but it's gonna stop. Where if you've got buffalo grass, you've mowed it or grazed it, and it's all this little short stuff. This is a running fire. And three miles per hour doesn't sound like much. But <laughs> my point in life three miles an hour is actually pretty darn fast. <laughs> so, so there's there's so much urban myth that goes with the prairie, and and I've been fighting it for 21 years, and I haven't won yet. But don't mow the prairie. The, the more you mow the prairie, the more problems you have. There's sometimes when mowing it is beneficial. You know, after everything's gone to seed, you can go mow it to spread seed around. You know, if you've got grass or wildflowers, so that's where it begins to be beneficial. But to, to mow it in the spring is just absolutely detrimental. There's also, Wyoming has some about 35 species of ground nesting birds, including a hawk. I mean, think about it, it's been prairie forever. And the birds don't have trees, they just have prairie. So they've adapted to the prairie. Our meadowlark, our state bird, likes to nest in stuff that looks like this, and they'll make kind of like a little teepee for a nest. So this is important to certain bird species to have tall grass. There's some other species that like it more open and they prefer this. But the bird nesting season is pretty much, um, they figure March through July. And I've even seen it go into August. Kildeers. Kildeers actually like it like this. <clears throat> and their eggs look, look just like little rocks. They're just perfectly camouflaged. It's just so amazing. Catherine. Yes. Would, would uh, uh, like the fescue be a better alternative to 
maybe in between the bluegrass and the buffalo? For a lawn? Yeah. No. Not really? Not really. Um, okay. Tall, tall turf type fescue needs like three quarters of an inch of water a week and bluegrass needs an inch of water a week. And how many of you measure how much water goes onto your lawn? <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, it's like when I when I first saw that one, it was like, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> really? So you can train your bluegrass lawn to be drought tolerant, but I, I would I never recommend unless someone's really, you know, determined a buffalo grass lawn. It's like eh, they're a lot of work, and I don't think you're gonna get a lot of um reward out of it. When during the season will that, uh, will the seed germinate? Will On buffalo grass? grass? So buff again, buffalo grass is a tough one because it, it's, um, again, it's in a capsule. And it takes quite a bit of water. It takes really a wet spring to get it to germinate. It, it's a tough one to get going. Okay. Yeah, so so when you when you end up with bare soil. No cover. Very happy weeds. Because now you've given weeds an opportunity, and, and again, weeds are opportunistic to begin with. So the weeds are going to move into those bare spots, and they're going to take over. And and we're and we're fighting weeds like crazy out here. It's um, leafy spurge, Dalmatian toads, backs, Russian thistle, a whole bunch of annuals. It, the book is the book is literally three inches thick, and it doesn't cover them all. And it just really comes down to we've done a very poor job of maintaining or and managing our prairie. And I've certainly seen big range areas where especially down in Colorado where they just hugely overgrazed land down in Colorado are really difficult to get anything to go back. And then when it does come back, it's this buffalo grass. And the only time you can really graze it is in the middle of the summer. Otherwise the animals are just eating brown, brown stuff that's not very nutritious. Loss of habitat, definitely. The, the other thing that happens when you, when someone's mowed it and you get just the, the buffalo grass or you've got a lot of weeds in there, um, brown squirrels move in, <laughs> ground squirrels. So in, in a ground squirrel's perfect world, in their perfect world, you have mowed the prairie so that they can see over the top of this. They think that this is just the perfect world ever. Happy little guy. <laughs> Smile on the face. Smiling. Because now this, this brown squirrel or prairie dog can see over the vegetation and they can see the predator coming. They can see that fox, that weasel, the coyote, cat, the dog, you name it. They can see it coming and they can jump back down into their hole. So it creates the perfect habitat for them to have the prairie mode. So if you've got a neighbor or someone who's complaining about all those rodents, my answer to them is stop mowing. Let the, let the prairie come back because as soon as it gets tall, this guy is gonna move to your neighbors for, for a moment. 
go move to the neighbors. So you can see on this chart where, you know, the more that's removed, the more that this biomass on top is removed, the more the roots stop growing and, and actually die off. And then horses, and, and I'm gonna pick on them. I've, I've owned horses off and on in my life. And, you know, they're pretty magical creatures. But horses have got an upper and a lower teeth. And it's it's kind of like almost they use them almost like fingers. And they'll come along to this grass and they'll <clears> pull it out by the roots. Where something like a cow, you know, your bovines, sheep, they have what's called a grazing palate. So they just have upper teeth but no lower teeth. And so they can't grab that. They don't, they're just physically cannot grab that and pull it out by the roots. And sheep will only graze something down to maybe about three inches, and then they, they're off looking for something better. But a horse will keep coming back and coming back and coming back, because as this grass grows, it's gonna be, the new growth is gonna be sweet and succulent. It's gonna be like candy. And so that horse is gonna come back and, and overgraze a very specific area, and right down to pulling the roots of the grass out. So as much as I love horses and equines in general, there should always be like a sacrificial area for them, a corral area, and then let them out periodically to graze, but not frequently. So in, in Wyoming and in the West in general, I run out of blood space. It takes, it takes about 40 acres per animal unit. Now, I'm not even going to put that in there. To support one animal. For one year. without hurting the prairie. So it takes about 40 acres per animal unit, which is one animal or a cow and calf, per year to, to support one animal without hurting, permanently hurting the prairie. So it really takes a lot of land. And I've, I've heard a lot of real estate people go, oh, 10 acres, all you need is 10 acres for a horse. Well, one horse is gonna go through 10 acres in about two months and then, and then it's gone. And, and so the prairie doesn't grow back quickly. So once, once this gets cut down, that grass is gonna to try to come back, but it's, it's gonna to try to put out a seed head and it's not really gonna recover unless there's a lot of rain. And even then it's not gonna recover back to its potential if it hadn't been mowed. So it's, the prairie is a very tricky place to try to raise animals. And, and so that's why I say have a sacrificial area for the, for the horse or horses, keep them in a corral. I have a corral that's, I have one corral that is, oh, it's about 100 feet long by about 40 feet wide with a shelter and water. And then they get fed there. And I have a bigger corral I can put them into, but I'm really careful about putting them out on the prairie because I, I know the damage they can do. And cattlemen, really good cattlemen, will look at the grass and they will take half and leave half rule. So it's the 50% rule. They'll graze 50%, which might be 10 days. Then they pull the animals off and they rotate that prairie, that, that pasture. So they move them on. So they're very, very careful. This last year was very difficult to try to do that, really difficult. Dakotas have wild herds of uh, horses, so I wonder if they're managing. But the horses are in the wild, they mean they're on the road always. Right. Buffalo right. And if it's the eastern part of the Dakotas, you've got more moisture. You know, we've got wild horses in Wyoming, and, and they're really just feral horses. 
and and that's a huge problem because people will dump a horse. They'll just take them out there and dump the horse that they don't want anymore. And so now you there, there's no more Mustangs out there. That bloodline's long gone, but they're just animals that people have dumped. They're just feral. So I have I have issues with that one. That's another soapbox. <laughs> and I just heard recently in the bad age that the they're sure of wild horses too. It's crazy up there in the West. Yeah, Nevada, Idaho, New Mexico, California. Yeah. I have two donkeys from the BLM that came from Death Valley. And it's like, really, Death Valley? But, and that's kind of an interesting one because the, the donkeys out there in Death Valley have learned to dig big, big holes and it'll actually fill with water. And so they're supporting other wildlife and they removed the donkeys only to have the other wildlife decline and they put the donkeys back and the, the wildlife came back. Yeah. Interesting animals to have to own. Okay. Number of acres support one animal or cow calf pair animal units varies from month to month. It might start off with 40 acres in April, May, first part of June, and then all of a sudden, you know, the rain switches off. And now by the end of the season, by August, you might be up to 80 acres to support one animal unit. So it, it varies as time goes on. So you can't, you can't ever have it as a, as a solid, this is what it takes all year because it varies so much. And that's why when a real estate person says, oh, 10 acres, Oh yeah, no. <laughs> so be very careful with that. Okay. Approximate grazing length and regrowth periods. As long as we're getting rain, as long as rain is happening, the regrowth, and it's not going to be huge regrowth. It's not going to be like your bluegrass lawn, but you're looking at about two weeks. So can mm -hmm. you keep that animal off for two weeks while that grass regrows? Maybe I like to I like to try to keep my animals off the, the prairie until after Fourth of July. I want this grass to produce a seed head. And remember, what you see on June first is what you're going to see for the rest of the year. If you absolutely making you crazy, I've got to mow it. Do it. Do it at the end of July, about frontier days. So that's, but then again, if you mow this, this is what's going to hold your snow and prevent drifting, especially around the house or barns or buildings. So you're going to have more drifting if you mow this. So this holds a lot of snow in the winter and the spring. Going to detour those wonderful brown squirrels by leaving it tall. But if you're trying to do wildflowers, you're trying to do a wildflower meadow, then you do need to go out and mow it because you need to knock that down the first couple of years as those flowers go to seed because you want to spread the seed and you want those wildflowers, especially if they're perennials, to really concentrate on, on root growth. So the, the prairie is complicated because one thing doesn't want to get mowed, but another thing needs to get mowed to encourage it to grow. So there's a there's a balance out there. And if you're going to do wildflowers on your prairie, have have like bands or islands of wildflowers. And you can see late summer period of regrowth. 45 days late summer, there's no 45 days. So so do be careful if you've got to go, you know, if you just feel that I got to ride the lawnmower. Sports. <laughs> I, I, recreational lawn mowing, I, I don't get it. <laughs> the only time I saw it that made sense was when I drove back east into Missouri and Indiana Anna and some of those places. And it made sense back there because back there they've got mosquito problems and tick problems and all sorts of bug problems. And so mowing that kind of reduces that, but the, it's so much rain and the regrowth is phenomenal. Okay. So this is actually out by me. One side was this, this guy had, had like 10 acres 
and he had 40 horses on that 10 acres and just raised it to the dirt. And the other side, the guy, you know, this is prairie, he just sort of mostly ignored it. But you can see how the horses leaned on that fence and how they grazed. So my neighbors have horses, and so I'll get on the I'll get on the riding on more. This is one of the few times where I do this, but I'll mow, and this is what I'll tell people to do, mow along your fence line so you can mitigate this problem if your neighbor has horses. So I'll mow along the fence line and I might mow up a couple of lengths just to prevent those horses from doing this to the fence. Because what happens is the horses break the fence and then my sheep go, oh, look. <laughs> and then my sheep end up down at their pasture, at their, at their barn. So, so this does a lot for um, neighbor relations just by mowing on my side of the fence. Yeah. But it's never dull. It is never dull out there. But you can see the difference. This, this is, he has since left. He's been gone for about six years. This is, looks a little better, not a whole lot, but it, it will take years, years, 20 years, maybe longer for that cool season grass to come back in here. Because now that cool season grass is in, in cool season, right? 45 degrees, is it happy? This, with the exposed soil and the heat, that soil is gonna be around 80 degrees or more. The cool season grass has got a tiny window in order to germinate and get going. This can take years, years for this to come back. Okay, uh, blue grandma. And buffalo grass, this is the, the C4 grass. And so blue grandma is a beautiful grass. They cultivated it in the nursery trade, in the horticulture trade. And it puts up this little seed head that's, that's like an eyelash. It's just really pretty. So yeah, not to scale, okay, not to, not to size. <laughs> so, so it's going to put up this very, very beautiful or, ornamental seed head. And the nursery trade has is, is really jumped on it. So you can buy that grass as an ornamental to put into your, into your garden. And it's very pretty. It's a very pretty grass. And pollinators, there's some native bees that like to burrow underneath it and live down in here. So it'll support some, because all your right, all your native pollinators, for the most part, are ground nesters. That's where they want to be. Okay, yep, there we go. So just a very pretty little seed head, kind of like an eyelash. Blue grandma. That's a C4 dress. Mm -hmm. So here's buffalo grass. And again, these, so this is, there's your male plant right there. And that's the female over there. And that, that seeds in a capsule. And it's usually a couple seeds in a, in a capsule. It takes a long time for that to germinate. So it's gotta be a, a, a wet spring for that guy, for those to come out and germinate. Some other cool season grasses. Anybody familiar with needle and thread grass? Really? I have one head shaking. Oh yeah. <laughs> I wanna say they're fun, but with, with uh, some hesitation. <laughs> they, they got this little, That's just, yeah, it's a, yeah. So it's very curly, and then there's a a very sharp seed head on here, and so little kids like to throw them at each other because it hurts when they get <laughs> you. The downside to needle and thread is that your animals can pick this up and it'll actually burrow down to their skin and cause problems. And so my sheep will pick this grass up. 
and they'll come back and it'll be sticking out of their foreheads, right? And they don't particularly like it when I pull it out because it's barbed here. And so it pulls. Western wheatgrass. This is the official state grass of Wyoming. And this is a beautiful grass. It's got a heathered blue green to it. It's just gorgeous. This is a sod former. It's a rhizominous grass. Once you get it going in your yard or garden, it's really hard to get rid of. But it's it's beautiful and you can try to make a lawn out of it or a mixed prairie lawn out of it. Sandburg bluegrass, it, that is a true bluegrass. Poa. Needle leaf sedge, that's gonna want a little, that's gonna want a lot more water. June grass, June grass is an annual. Once it gets going, it's just absolutely beautiful. The seed head on it is almost like a bottle brush and it's gold, golden color, and the sun hits it just right, it just glows, it's beautiful. Indian rice grass, we had someone here in Wyoming try to actually grow and harvest Indian rice grass for the seed to make flour out of it. But those are all native. Needle on thread grass, yeah, fun one. Beautiful seed head, you know, if you're into doing Floral arrangements. This is really a fun one to add to floral arrangements. The needle and thread reminds me of what I've known to be for like foxtails. You ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah, foxtail. Yeah, foxtail could be a problem. Cheat grass is a problem too, as far as grazing animals go. Yeah. You know what grass? No. Foxtail. What? Julie, do you have a question? No, just me. Um, as far as uh, these are all C4 grasses, you said? So these ones here are C3. C3, okay. Got so that one your, wrong. Yeah, these are all your cool season grasses. Okay. Cool season. And I'll get this lecture to you. I can't get the board to you. I can't get the whiteboard to you, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Western wheatgrass, yeah, that doesn't do it much kind of disservice, but beautiful grass, sandberg, bluegrass. Identifying prairie grasses is tedious. And the, and the book is like that thick and they refer to as tribes. So it'd be like the rye, the rye grass tribe and the wheatgrass tribe. And, and so you, it helps to have that seed head in order to identify them. Needle leaf sedge, this is spring. This is a true, loves a cool, comes up in the spring and then disappears. Prairie June grass. I've got, I'll have to put in a better picture. Indian rice grass, I think this guy is just gorgeous, but I can't imagine trying to harvest it and do a flower out of it. But some guy, some guy tried. Okay, then water laws. So if you buy property and there's an irrigation ditch going on your property, the water belongs to the state until it gets to the end user. And so once it gets to the end user's land, then it becomes that person's water. But in the meantime, the water belongs to the state. And the state's philosophy and, and doctrine is first in time, first in right. So if your water rights go back to territorial Wyoming and someone else comes in in 2023, then your water laws are senior, and then that person can't call water and exclude you. So you can, if your water rights go back to territorial Wyoming, then only if there's a surplus of water does that person that just got their water rights ever get one. Water rights 
rare they get allocated anymore, very rare. Same thing with um, groundwater for, for uh, agriculture, really rare. If I think the last time there was some air, um, agriculture water permits issued for deep wells was back in the 70s. They're just not permitting agricultural water. But all the water is owned by the state and it must be permitted. So it's got to be in your name. Yep. So water crossing your land is not for not it's not yours to use. You can look at it, you can watch it go by, you can go, oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> but uh it, again, it belongs to the state till it gets to the end user. Yep, big old drill going in. Domestic water. And the domestic water permits are 25 gallons per minute. And I think a lot of times you're lucky if you can get that much. There's some new subdivisions that have been approved and platted up uh, south of the Gilcrest High School, Gilcrest Elementary School, out by Bunkhouse, out on Happy Jack, okay. out west of Cheyenne, okay, up a little higher. No guarantee of water. No guarantee of water. So if you buy land, that's the first thing you should be asking is what's the water situation? Is there water? Has water been tested and proven to be you know, tested well? Do we know there's water here? How deep is that well? Because a lot of the wells go 500 to 700 feet. And when you get out <clears throat> west of town, you're most likely getting on a perch of water. Can I get rid of that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. We used to have one of the state engineers come in and talk about water and water rights in Wyoming. And I think very highly of this particular individual, but he really gets, he's an engineer. <laughs> and that should tell you a lot right there. Okay. <laughs> no detail too small. We'll call that Cheyenne. And then this is West. And then out here is East. So the aquifer, which is always, yes. How many of you went to um, the Habitat Hero program this Saturday? And you got to see Cheryl Eddie Miller's depiction of the the groundwater. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That thing, that's really cool. So as it as the water goes, if this was the aquifer, I'm not even sure it does that, but <laughs> okay, so we'll call this the uh, aquifer. You might get what's called a perch of water out here. And so that's like a little bowl. And so your straw has got to go really deep, 700 to 900 feet. And so this bowl out west, not always a lot of water in that and real easy to drain it. So be really careful if you're going to buy land and you want to live out in the county, 
what is the water situation? How deep is the well? Have you done a test well? How many gallons per minute is the flow? And this isn't unusual to have someone put their water, go, oh, I've got really good water, but they're in a perch. And I've had people come back and say, you know, after I've explained this to them, you know, this perch, this little water bowl, they drained it trying to water their windbreak. And it took them two days to refill their little bowl up with water. So be really careful. And they're hauling water now. They have a cistern and they haul water because that's just too unpredictable for them. There's areas out here east of Cheyenne too that there's no water. So if you move out onto the prairie, you should really be asked, that's, that's your first question is what's the water? What's the water situation? And then they've got a lot of acreage that's seven acres and it's just not, it's not big enough. You've got, you have a septic tank and a well and your neighbors have a septic tank and a well. And we really don't know in some areas how far apart they should be. And then there's some acres where it's only two and a half acres. And I don't think they let allow two and a half acres anymore because you have a septic tank at a well and so do your neighbors. And so you, you just want to be really careful with all that. And I guarantee you the state engineer's office has got some crazy stories. So, so that aquifer, is that a moving underground moving stream? Pretty much. Pretty much. So for, for all of you who listened to Cheryl Eddie Miller's program, any comments about what she said about the aquifer? Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It's really easy to get it contaminated. Especially really, when really. she started using the dyes. Yeah. She could see it. Scary. Yeah, very scary. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it is it is moving. It does move from high to low. These little perches get filled. They drain. Yeah, that's it. I think this is the farther west you go, even though this area is really beautiful, the water is so unpredictable. You know, and that and to have, buy land with no guarantee of water, that means can you imagine hauling water? This last December when it was minus 25. Oh. Oh. Not fun. Okay. Okay. So within the state engineer's office, and if you have questions about water. You know, and you do move out to the county or you're already out there and you have questions about your well, the state engineer's office is by far the best place to go to get sound, unbiased advice. Real estate agents in Wyoming aren't going to have the answer. So if you're buying land and you ask them questions about the well, they're not going to tell you anything. So you have to do your own due diligence. Call the state engineer's office. That well needs to be 200 feet from the property line, 100 feet from the leach field. And, and then you've got to have some sort of protection around that wellhead to prevent contamination. You know, if you've got dogs, you don't want them around that wellhead. And, and so there's, there's some things you need to do to be very careful and, and protect that wellhead. And make sure you get a well driller who's got a good reputation and knows what they're doing. And then after they drill that well, they should be dumping bleach down in there to get rid of any contamination. Because it's real easy to get E. coli and salmonella down into your well. You gotta be very careful. And the pump or the motor on your well will only go out in a blizzard at Christmas or when you have a house full of people. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So once you drill a well, you're not guaranteed any water. You gotta obtain a ground, you gotta obtain a, a well permit. It's gotta be adjudicated to your land and it's adjudicated to the land, not to you. And obtaining a groundwater permit does not guarantee that you will be able to construct a good water well. Geology dictates what is or not available. So when you go out towards Pine Bluff, that's a fractured granite formation and the water filtrates through is very, very fast. And I even hesitate to use the word filtrates because I've read, I've listened to the city people in Pine Bluffs go, oh, yep, we're going to get a rain and we know that well level is going to go up. It's it's just within 24 hours, the well level goes up. And it's like, they got a chance to filter, did it? And there's quite a few feedlots around Pine Bluff. So do some research. You're going to move out to the county. You know, it's a great life out there, but do some good research before you move out there. Make sure that you get a good well. Okay, there's their phone numbers. There's the National Groundwater Association if you really want to get geeky about this. But the, uh, the state engineer's office is your, is your go-to people, hands down. They, they will tell you what's going on in your area water-wise and whether your neighbors have got water or not, how deep, how deep to go for water. And the wells seem to be getting deeper and deeper. And then I do have some literature from Saturday's program on wells. So right behind where Joe's sitting, there's some, some literature left over. <laughs> Water testing. So the city and county, yeah. Very quick. I mean, I live out in the county, but a neighbor that we call the stranger, if you like show that there would be a, but you would like turn on a stranger and then like not show up for like 72 hours and you just go down and stop. Okay. So the question is, it lives out in the county, has a neighbor that kind of part-time, or not being kind, he's part-time, comes in, turns on his sprinkler system, leaves it running for several days, and then comes back and turns it off. He needs to buy a timer. My gosh, 40 bucks and he can have a timer and save a big electric bill. There's nothing to say he can't do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm letting it clear for like 40 hours and just mow his kind of aggressive. Yeah, he, he just needs to leave the prairie alone. I've written a lot of brochures about living on the prairie and I and it's I've edited over the years and re-edited, and I finally just got out and just I'm just blunt about it. And the title on it is the more you mow, the more problems you're gonna have. <laughs> And so he's watering and mowing and watering and mowing. It's like, do you live to mow? You know, born to ride that tractor. I... From like building to golf, I think he's going to go around golf. Well, California is, like yeah, but California's got yeah, some. Great green square. Oh. All of us. Yeah, California's got water problems big time. California is always in a drought. It never is out of a drought. In areas like San Diego, three to four inches of water is their annual moisture level. My brother lives in Palm Springs, has about two to three inches. And in Palm Springs, they have 130 golf courses. What are they thinking? Really? I, I, I don't get it, but anyway. If you're out in the county, you've got a well for, for like, well, for free, the city and county health department, which is just right, this lab right up here, they'll test your water for E. coli, for fecal chloroform bacteria. You can send it out to a private lab if you wanna know what the NPK, the EC, the pH is, and especially vegetable gardening, if you wanna know what that, because the water is a huge component to what happens in your vegetable garden. You can't discount the water. But that's the other half of the equation. 
So you can send it out to a private lab and for you know, 20, $20, $30, they can give you all that information and, and it might be worth it. If you're in town, you can call up the Board of Public Utilities and they will email you or you can go pick up the water test. It's free. Pretty consistent, pH is eight and a half, so it's alkaline, naturally alkalized water. They don't add any fluoride to the water, which is controversial, right? Fluoride in the water. They don't add fluoride to the water with the city of Cheyenne. It's naturally there. The fluoride is just naturally in the water, so they don't add any more to it, which is, which is another, <laughs> Another thing that you gotta wanna be mindful of, and this is why talking to the state engineer's office if you wanna move out onto land is important. There's an area up in Campbell County, a little town called Rosette, and their water is so high in fluoride that they actually should not drink it because fluoride causes, a, it accumulates in your bones, and it's very, very painful after a while. So you gotta be careful with too much fluoride which is the problem up in Campbell County. And that water is also very alkaline up there. So good number to know, state engineer's office, get your water tested, know what's going on. Okay, fencing. So I did not know when I moved out onto the county, out into the country, that I was going to become really good at building fences. They may not be pretty, but they can keep my bullet. And that's the important thing, right? <laughs> so there are state statutes on fencing and what fencing should be minimum, the minimum for fencing. Fence made of steel, concrete, or sound wooden posts. Sound wooden posts. I have seen all sorts of things used. I've seen, you know, tree branches. I've seen wood chopped in half used as a fence post. I have pulled some old concrete posts out of my place. And if I could figure out how to make concrete posts, that's all I would use. Because they don't rot. They don't rot. And they can't be bent over like a T-post can. And they just last forever. I, I just, I think they're amazing. Let's see, wooden posts will be at least four inches in diameter. Yeah, well, farm and ranch stores sell three inch in diameter fence posts, so apparently they haven't read this. 20 inches deep <clears throat> and no greater distance than 22 feet apart. You better be able to really string that wire tight at 22 feet apart. And because for a while I used to raise goats. There, there was a whole nother adventure raising goats. So the joke with goats is, if it holds water, it will hold a goat. <laughs> if it holds water, it'll hold a goat. Goats will rub a fence till it falls apart. They'll climb a fence, they'll dig under a fence. They will work that fence. They have nothing better to do than try to escape. Okay. So, so all my fence, everything I build is five feet on center because of the goats. But anyway, there's just so you know that there is a state statute on the minimum for what a fence should be. Cost sharing. This is this is where it can get a little dicey. You build a fence, you go to your neighbor and say, <clears throat> I just put up a fence on our property line. We're both benefiting from it. And and because it's a shared fence, you're responsible for. 50% of the cost. That, that could get really interesting pretty quick. I suggest you talk to your neighbor first and then build the fence second. Okay, dogs. So I have <clears throat> two big livestock guardian dogs for my sheep and my cattle. 
And they're, they're really good, but they've bonded to those animals. And so they stay with them unless there's a coyote in the wheat field. And then they're off. Then it's game over. <clears throat> or there's coyotes down in the creek and then they're down in the creek. So my, my dogs don't run at large, but they are with my livestock. So on the other hand, if someone moves out to the county and they go, wow, I can, I'm going to get a big dog and I'm going to let the dog run. And the dog escapes and starts harassing someone's livestock. The owner of the livestock has a right to kill that dog. So the owner of the livestock has a right to protect their livestock. And if that means that they have to shoot a stray dog in their corral in order to protect their livestock, they can. And a state statute protects them. So it's a public nuisance. It's written in the books. So, and, and it's actually a little bit more in depth than what this is on, on, this, on this slide. Dog injuring or killing livestock, and it's also or harassing or hazing livestock may be killed by the owner of the livestock or his agent or any peace officer. Okay, that's another touchy subject when you live out in the county. But just know that if you do move out to the county and you are raising sheep or goats or you have cattle or, or whatever out there, that you have a right to protect those animals. That's your right. And, and I, I can't tell how many times I've talked to people who are like, I don't know what to do. Call the cops or get a gun. Okay, windbreaks. We've talked a little bit about windbreaks in the um, site analysis class. And a windbreak, if you go to the conservation district, they will design a windbreak for you. So they take a lot of that work out of it. And then they have this cool equipment that they'll come and they'll plant the windbreak for you and put the black plastic down. Strongly recommend that you do that. Have them do all the work for you. You are responsible for the irrigation and getting your windbreak watered. And those little baby trees, and we kind of differ on this, the conservation district and I, but I, I encourage people to water once a day and to give them a good one hour soak. They're just baby trees. They're just baby. They're, they need all the help they can get. So that snow break, that wind break, and I, and I encourage you to work with the conservation district on it because they know where to place it so that you're not going to bury your house with a snow drift. And if you go back to that lecture, the site analysis lecture, and snow likes to accumulate on the south side of an east-west line. And so if you've got that east-west line too close to your house, you're gonna have a monster drift that could damage your house. So you wanna be careful on that placement. And it's always that south side that seems to be the worst. So when I go by some other names, shelter belt, living snow fence, Living, to me, a living snow fence is something that's going to get, you know, maybe three feet tall. That to me is a living snow fence. Shelter belts, you know, those are amazing animal habitats. And other than attracting a lot of bunnies in there, they're also going to bring in foxes and a plethora of birds that like trees. So it could be quite the habitat, wildlife habitat. They do increase the value of your property to have a windbreak on there. Of course, the most obvious is that they're put in there to help decrease your heating bills so that you're not fighting the wind. And where the trees are placed, you know, where your shade trees are placed in the summer, they're gonna decrease your cooling bills. But trying to capture that snow and hold it on your property is really important because that snow is going to just naturally water your trees. You know, so you want everything. You don't want to limb up your, your shelter belt, right? I've seen people do that. And then the wind just scoots right underneath all those trees. But if the, if the tree branches aren't all the way onto the ground, you can't capture and hold the snow, right? And so when you capture and hold the snow, now you're banking the water. 
And now you're just naturally watering those trees. And that's the water, the time to water for maximum tree growth is March, April, and May. That's the months, that's the critical months for getting those trees to have their maximum amount of growth. Wildlife habitat. That's always fun. It depends on what you want. Okay, weeds. Fences seem to really attract weeds. That, that seems to be their favorite possible place. So let's take a quick break. Let's take about a 10 minute break. Again, I've, I've got um, coffee and tea over there and some snacks. So let's take a break. And I'm gonna go email Kim. Yeah, and the <laughs> they just got one root that holds them. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't do my assignment. Yeah. 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 Y
the and then there's that other thing. Don't walk on the green streets. <laughs> don't walk barefoot on the green street streets. So are you are you out in the county or did you get so I'm in the city over there? Thank you. 
Okay, so let's get back for class. And I do have, I have some things to hand out. So there's a lot of publications out to help you combat the weeds. And one of the ways is to go back and reseed with the uh, wildflower seeds or plant wildflowers. The conservation district has a brand new, brand new no-till drill, which means that as it moves along, there's blades in the back that just cut a furrow. The seed drops into that furrow, and then there's a bar with a chain, and it just rakes all the soil back over and covers the seeds. So that means you're not ripping up, you're tilling, following. You're just putting it in in the most non-invasive way possible. And so it's a very good way to reseed early. And the University of Wyoming um, puts out barnyards and backyards. It's a very good magazine for living on the land. I've got more of these, like current ones actually, but if you're if you're looking for information on living out on the land, this is a really great publication. Because once these weeds get going, they're really, really difficult to take back. They are survivalists, they're opportunists. And if there's bare spots in the soil, they're gonna they're gonna take advantage of that over grass and they'll help peak grass every time. They like exposed or disturbed soils, so. <laughs> So if you're out on the prairie and they've had to dig up a big area to put in the leach field or the septic tank or around the house, it's going to be disturbed soil. That's going to be challenging to get reestablished back into grass. There is a very narrow window for getting your grass seed in the ground and getting it to germinate. So we, I go by the Farm Service Agency's rule of thumb for when you should have seed planted out on the prairie. And that's Mother's Day. Before or on Mother's Day. If it's after Mother's Day, you, you may have lost your window for planting seed and getting it to germinate naturally because you can't water a big area and trying to get seed to germinate can be a two week adventure of keeping the ground moist. So try to plant 
any time from February to Mother's Day. And that's for the soil moisture to really take advantage of that because this is when we're gonna get our most amount of moisture this spring. This is where it comes, it normally theoretically comes fairly consistently where it stays on the ground and it keeps the ground moist so that these seeds can germinate. But once you start getting in the drier season, after Mother's Day, you start getting into June, you've lost that window. And if you try to seed in the summer, all you're doing is feeding the birds or feeding the insects or the wind is gonna blow it away. So very tiny window to get this in. You could probably try doing it in late October and just you know hope that there's moisture to hold it and it doesn't, doesn't rot. That would be the other concern is it would rot. <clears throat> Doing a no-till drill is going to be the best way to get that seed into the ground. And again, that, that no-till drill just does little, little furrows. There's blades on the back, and it does little furrows. And there's a seed tube, and the tube just drops in a seed, and there's a wheel that rotates internally. And so a seed will drop in like every inch apart. And then there's a, a bar behind it with a, usually a chain is dragged so that it covers that seed back up with soil. That's the best way to get your land seeded. If you go out there and you're doing this, you're throwing seed around, right? You will make every horned lark in the county happy because you just fed them. So the little birds, the little prairie birds are just going to be ecstatic over that. Would you recommend staying for in town and staying for the time coming? For non-irrigated areas, yes. Yeah. If you've got an irrigated lawn and you're going to rip some of it up, you're going to plant a, a wildflower island. That's just pretty easy to do that irrigation. You can get a permit from. So if you want to do, if you're in town and you want to rip up some of your lawn to plant flowers, plant a wildflower island, you can get a permit from the Board of Public Utilities mm -hmm. to water that because you need to water it every day. You need to keep that soil moist. So never let it dry out. And it takes about two weeks to get that to germinate and come up. So it's, it's a two week babysitting job. You're not gonna take a vacation in this time. Um, okay, so the other Catherine. thing, is, yes, PJ. <laughs> now you said to get a hold of the um, uh, Board of Public Utilities, they will help you do that. They'll give you. You have to get a permit from okay. them. Okay. Water on your non on the days you're not supposed to water. So when you seed a lawn or you put a new sod in. You've got right. your, the Board of Public Utilities. The same thing if you rip out some of your lawn and you're going to put in wildflowers, you know, right. wildflower island, then you've got to, you still have to get a permit. That's, okay. that's the only thing they're going to do is give you a permit so that they don't over, so they don't come and give you a nasty note and say, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I don't go off to the hooskow, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things that weeds do, and they're very good at this, is that they alter the soil. So they alter the site where they're at. And Dalmatian toad flax, leafy spurge, Cheatgrass are all really good examples of this and that they make the area, they're what's called aliopathic. And so they make that area around where they're growing toxic to any other plant that tries to grow there. And if you go out into a patch of Dalmatian toad flax and you look down, you'll actually see what looks like a burnt area. And it's that plant's ability to exude a chemical 
that acts as a natural herbicide that kills its neighbor. So it's, it's a natural thing that it does to eliminate the competition. And that's, that's one way that they spread. They can add salts to the soil, salt cedar, can add huge amount of salt back to the soil. And so that's the EC, the electric conductivity. We've talked about that. And so they can change it to the point where only salt cedar can live in that spot. We have some salt cedar here in Cheyenne. There's a bunch of people that watch that really close so that it doesn't jump because it seeds are pretty fertile and it can start springing up in places you don't want it. And it can take over waterways and almost impossible to eradicate. So we're very careful in watching some of these weeds. Cheatgrass is what we call a winter annual. So cheatgrass is, again, likes, likes this temperature right here, 45 degrees. This is when it's gonna germinate. So about November, it's a winter annual. So when it starts to get cool and damp and moist out, 45 degrees and it's germinating. And it's, you don't really notice it until it's about three inches tall. And it has a purple, the, the little, the young plant has kind of a purple look to it. it. Looks just like grass, but it's kind of, it's almost the color of your shirt. Yeah, it's, it's that color. I'll do a visual right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's almost that color. So very, very interesting. This last year was one of the few years where I was actually grateful to have cheatgrass because it was one of the few things left for my animals to graze on. Very, at that point, it's very nutritious. It's about 23% protein. So it has a lot of value to it. I don't like it. By June, it has done growing and it has sent up a seed stalk and it's gone, the whole plant has gone brown. And that seed stalk, are you, any of you familiar with cheatgrass? Yeah, some of you. If you're out on the prairie, I guarantee you've got cheatgrass someplace on your property. So cheatgrass, <clears throat> when uh, Governor Meade was, Governor, they had a task force you know, that talked about cheatgrass. Did anything ever come out of that? Um, we, we've continued to do a lot of research on it. UW used to have a weed specialist that did that. They've, they've looked at some natural controls for it. They, it's, it's just such a tough customer. There's some herbicides you can put down, but the herbicides have their drawbacks. There's one called plateau and another one called exceed. And you put them down just before this. So like the end of October, I mean, you gotta watch the weather like hawk. So you, you gotta put it down before this germinates. And so when you put plateau or exceed down, it, it's very effective on this. It, it'll keep this down for anywhere from one to three years. But the downside is you cannot go back in and reseed after you put those down. So you need to hope that there's enough native grass that can come back and grow well. But cheatgrass has got this, again, it's almost as bad as, well, it's worse than needle and thread grass. It's got this all on it like that. So this is the seed. And it turns brown. There can be anywhere from 50 to 150 seeds per plant. And if an animal is run out of food and, and now this animal's got this to eat, it gets packed up in their cheeks and in their gum area. And it causes a lot of abscesses and sores. Which, which equates to, this will cause you a vet bill. <laughs> Look at it, go oh vet bill. <laughs> so, so that's that's the problem with it. 
increases wildfire freak wildfire frequency. This goes brown in June, and you can see a whole you can see hillsides of it. And if you look at some of the subdivisions on the west side of I-25, where they've mowed and mowed and mowed, and the only thing that's growing now is cheatgrass, and the whole hillside is cheatgrass. So they've got there's there's a couple houses. You know, here's the house on top of the hill. Because by golly, I gotta live on top of the hill. Right? And this is all cheap grass. If this catches on fire, fire loves to go uphill. It, it's just, it will just race. So there's a lot of problems with cheatgrass and that it does cause, you know, it goes brown and it, it should, it's a concern. It's a huge concern. This is another problem of, of excessive mowing and trying to control cheatgrass. UW up at Lingle has got several test plots and they did that. So back when Governor Meade was in, UW did all those test plots and they've tried grazing it. They've tried spraying it. They tried grazing and then spraying and you know, burning it. They tried all sorts of stuff. But what we know is that if you burn this, the first thing that will germinate after a fire is cheatgrass. It's just that bad. And there's some places up in Cybel Canyon, which is between Wheatland and Laramie. Beautiful drive. I mean, if you want to take the long way home and you're in Wheatland and you want to go the long way, Cybel Canyon into Laramie and in home. Really pretty dry. A lot of sheet grass up there. It was up there with the weed specialist, and he speculated that there was a 20-year seed bank of sheet grass up there. So it's it's hard to get rid of. And when you have a grass fire, grass fires typically don't go very deep and they're pretty cool. So they don't burn off that, that seed bank. So it's a hard one to deal with. It's a hard one to fight. And you just there's a point where you just have to stop using chemicals because you're, you're not controlling it. They did find that using pubescent wheatgrass worked the best as far as being able to outgrow this. So if you had a cheatgrass stand and you could get in there and reseed with wheatgrass, the cool season wheatgrasses, you could, you could get a handle on this and suppress it. But it is a tough one. Yeah. Is that the one that's about uh, two, three foot tall and has like a really shallow root system? Really, really shallow root system. It gets, it doesn't get very tall. And it's, it's really very short grass. Like that's on a foot? Yeah, I think it's like that, about three inches. The root system is, is like two inches. So there's another thing with cheatgrass is that if it rains, you know, we never get a lot of rain. You know, when a storm comes through, we might get a, like a hundredth of an inch or two hundredths of an inch, you know, not much. But this, because it's got shallow root system, takes the water first, you know, where you've got this deep rooted, you know, prairie grass. It doesn't get the water, this guy does. And this will put up several seed heads. Turns brown in June. A lot of problems with cheap grass. But they tried, there's they're looking for insects that will go after it. They haven't found anything. And for a while, they thought they could alter the soil microbiology. And so this is a fungal dominant soil. That's what this guy likes. And they found kind of by accident that Pseudomonas, which is a bacteria, can alter this soil microbiology and this guy will die out. 
but it takes about three years and Pseudomonas is temperature dependent. And so here's the catch. It has to be overcast, cool and raining out to apply this Pseudomonas. Does that describe Wyoming to any of you? <laughs> really? Cheyenne Frontier Day. <laughs> I, I've, I've seen it snow on frontier days. Okay. Yeah. So how do weeds spread? Well, it's kind of self-explanatory. Irrigation, roadside work, construction, vehicles, tillage, contaminated seed. So that was the other thing they did with the... Um, in their quest to try to get rid of cheat grass. And this is this is like wrong. The plant should be shouldn't be able to do this. Because wildflower seed mixes are quite frequently contaminated with cheat grass seeds. One of the researchers at UW thought, well, germinates at this temperature. So he got the whole seed mix wet, dropped it down to this temperature, cheat grass germinated, the wildflower seeds didn't. Great. Brought, dried everything off, brought it back up. Cheatgrass still survived germinating, being dried off, and then rehydrated. That is unique, unique. And it's wrong. <laughs> That's just wrong. So if you ever take horses up into the mountains, you need to have certified weed-free hay and hard to find. You're going to pay for it. It's And uh, the state will come out and inspect your hay field. And then they give you special twine to do the bales with. And it's, it's a kind of barber pole colored twine so that it marks it out from other hay. Really hard to find because almost no one does small squares anymore. <laughs> it's really hard to pack in a big round bale. Okay, downy brome. So this is the guy I'm talking about. Cheat grass. This is what this is what the seed looks like, and it goes brown. Increases fire frequency. <clears throat> big fire out in eastern Colorado. This was back in like 2007. I got just, I got about 20 miles before Sterling, Colorado, and it was just all burned. And it, it was, it was incredible. Yeah, yeah, it was just incredible. Nevada caught on fire, northern part of Nevada. It was all cheatgrass. It was a big cheatgrass fire. Field bindweed. I, persistence, persistence. Yeah, wind. Hard, hard to control this one. I, I've had horses that will graze it while it's in the flowering stage, but you don't want them to graze it when it's gone to seed because they, they just poop out the seed in little fertilizer packets. So, so you got to graze it before, you've got to pull it. You've got to just be persistent, persistent, persistent. There's an area over off of Rich Road where the bindweed has gone under the asphalt from one housing development. It's gone under the asphalt, went over to the church, and it's pushing up through the asphalt. Yeah, this, this is crazy. This is crazy. Reproduces by seed, which remain viable for up to 50 years. Yeah. So again, that's why I say persistence. Is there a common name for that? Bindweed? Just feel bindweed. Yeah. Or part of the family at Morning Glory. Yep. 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 Morning Glory family. Yep. This is Dalmatian toad flax. And this is one that a lot of people either, either don't know how to identify or just look at it and go, oh, look at that pretty wildflower. But it looks like yellow snapdragons. It looks just like a snapdragon. And 
it's wildlife cannot eat this because of the, the alkaloids in the sap. So it's toxic to wildlife, toxic to domestic wildlife or domestic animals. Although I've seen horses, I've seen horses eat the flowers. I'm, I'm sure there's the reward of nectar there, so the horses will eat it. This is a perennial. It's deep rooted. It is very hard to get rid of. I have pulled it. I, I find it on my pasture and I pull it, I hand pull it. And that seems to work, even though it's got this big underground root structure, pulling it seems to be okay. Trying to control it with herbicides. And, and again, weeds have such a different physiology from domesticated plants that trying to control them, everything is about timing. And most people get the timing wrong. It's like the time to deal with cheatgrass is in November or real early April if there's ground is available. You know, there's no snow on the ground. And again, if you're out in the county, you've got to, it, it helps to know your soil because the last thing you want to do is spray, put down an herbicide and think you're okay, but end up with it in your groundwater. So that's another consideration is know your soil, know what you're on. If you don't know what your soil is, is the conservation district should be able to help you. A farm service agency should be able to help you and tell you what, what your soil is. You know, it's one thing to dig down a shovel step and go, well, this is my gardening soil, but what is the rest of the soil that, that goes down to the water, the aquifer? That's the important thing to know. So the time to control a lot of your a lot of your perennials, your perennial weeds, is in the fall. How many of you would have guessed the summer? And you can see it, yeah. So after the first frost, is when you wanna spray this. And the reason for, the reason for spraying it after the first frost, is that the, the, the frost tells the plant that winter is coming. Days are getting shorter, nights are getting cooler, then you get hit with a frost. That frost tells that plant to start taking more energy from the leaves and put it into the roots. Well, when you spray an herbicide on there like 2,4-D, Banville, Plateau, Milestone, and the list is huge. It sits on the leaves and the leaves take it up through those stomata cells, takes it up osmotically. And the plant then takes that, that herbicide and takes it down to the roots, along with the rest of the sugars getting set up for winter. So now you've got an herbicide where it needs to be in the roots. This is the same for thistle, for all of you who are fighting thistle, right, fighting thistle. The time to control it, there's a couple times. One, when you first see it in the spring, when you first spot it, when it's at the blooming stage, because it's very vulnerable then, or after that first frost, any other time and it's herbicide resistant, it just, it, you're just not gonna achieve anything. You'll spray it on there and go, nothing's happening. And it's because it's the wrong time to spray it or treat it. So there's just a couple of windows very narrow windows to treat these guys with herbicides. This is leafy spurge. And again, it's got an alkaloid sap. And again, it's not, it's not palatable to wildlife or livestock. They do have goats trained to eat this stuff. And so, once in a while, you'll see Lanny coming through and you'll see goats along Crow Creek in Cheyenne and they're controlling the leafy spurge with these goats. And they're, 
you know, I've been watching them fight this for over 20 years. And there's, you know, after 20 years, they're still trying to outgraze leafy spurge. And leafy spurge is still winning. They have it on the base. The base doesn't do a lot about it. <clears throat> it's there's quite a bit north of Cheyenne. But this is another one that just requires a lot of persistence in trying to eradicate it. You do not want this on your property. It, it outcompetes the native plants. And so when you start having these evasive plants outcompeting your natives, you start losing your wildlife diversity. So you have to go back and say, well, what, what does wildlife mean to me? Birds, butterflies, native pollinators, bumblebees, you know, those, those all fall into that category of wildlife. And depending upon what organization you talk to, like Pheasants Forever, but they consider bees, native bees, to be a keystone species. And that means that these bees are running around and pollinating flowers that are producing seed that feed their birds, that feed other small mammals. The small mammals then feed bigger mammals. And so they look at bees as being a keystone species. So when you start getting these non-native evasive weeds like your leafy spurge, your toad flax, your thistles, they outcompete and you start having a net loss. So for everyone who sat through Habitat Hero program on Saturday, you know, I'm probably you're, you're probably hearing a rerun, hopefully. So you want to be very careful with these weeds and you want to try to replace them, get rid of them, fight them, persistence, and and try to get native plants back in. Okay, here's another fun one. This is Russian thistle. This is some of these guys get huge. I mean, almost like the size of a small Volkswagen Beetle. It's an annual. And once it germinates, it looks just like grass. But once you, if you reach down there and pull it, it's very thick and leathery. So it's, and so you can quickly learn to identify it just by touch and feel, and then start to pull it when you find it. I've I've tried grazing it with not a lot of success. So one of those big old tumbleweeds, anywhere from 20,000 to 50,000 seeds. So that is a lot. And as it rolls, as it tumbles, it's throwing those seeds. So that's how it disperses it. The flowers are very small, inconspicuous. So you can, very, very tiny. Inconspicuous, it's, they're gonna flower and you're not even gonna notice it. <clears throat> and again, it does threaten native plant ecosystems, but if it gets into your fence, it can pull a fence down. So that's that's something that I'm always fighting out where I live is, is the Russian thistle. When it catches on fire, it is explosive. And this is what gives the prairie kind of a bad rap for being you know, flammable because people see these things explode when a fire, see that catches on fire. It's fast because there's a lot of, a lot of uh, natural creosotes in there. And so it just kind of goes squish. And it's a big tall fire that jumps way up. And so the prairie gets a bad rap as being flammable and people go out and mow the prairie and then they end up with more weeds and they end up with more of these guys. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And then when it's in this green stage, it's there's a lot, a lot of little thorns on it. And so it causes contact dermatitis. So you can end up with some skin problems from trying to pull it when it's in the big stage. Windborne pollen. So for those of you with, with pollen allergies, this doesn't help it at all. Larkspur. Anyone familiar with Larkspur? So the people who live on the prairie, any of you raise cattle or trying to do some cows, steers? Okay. So Larkspur, this is a native 
It's a beautiful flower, and the bees just love it. Native. For cattle, it is extremely toxic. A fourth pound of this, a fourth of a pound, will kill a 1,200 pound cow in 36 hours. Yes. Yep. Coming home one day from work, stopped at my neighbor's house. He had just put out a whole bunch of Carinti cattle out. And the Carinti cattle are the ones with the big horns. This people rope cattle, lease Carintis for roping on. And he had just turned out a whole bunch of these leased Carintis into a field full of larkspur. Mm -hmm. And I stopped and went up to his house, introduced myself, gave him my business card. And he says, well, okay, how can I help you? And I go, I'm here to help you. You've just turned all your cattle out into a field of larkspur and explained to him the larkspur. I said, you don't have a lot. I said, if you have some kids, go out and have them pull the larkspur before your cattle die. And I couldn't get out of his way fast enough. I did another yard call where a guy had bought 150 acres and he wanted to raise a few head of cattle. He's like, gets me out there. He lives on top of a hill. It's a beautiful place, just gorgeous. And he goes, now I want you to point out the larkspur. We're going to go for walking. You, you point larkspur out. And I said, I don't have to. I said, you see all that blue out there in your pasture? That's larkspur. He had almost 100 acres of larkspur. Yeah. Yeah. I... So all parts of the plant are toxic. Seeds, leaves, flowers, roots. It's, it can get about four feet high. I've, I've only ever seen it about, well, that year I saw it four feet high. Um, typically, I see it about two feet tall, 18 inches to two feet tall. Again, it's a, it's a beautiful plant. It's, it's native. It's beautiful. But it's very toxic. If you don't have livestock, enjoy it. What's that? Yeah, you can buy it as a, an ornamental plant to put in your garden and get it a seed plant it. Yeah. It's toxic. It's toxic. Yeah. 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 Grows wild, easy to get growing from seed, easy to grow from plants. Very palatable, which is why it's so deadly to cattle. That's why it's so dead. It's tasty. It's probably sweet. They'll eat a lot of it. Quarter pound. Quarter pound is it. Sheep and cat sheep and horses can eat a lot before it causes them problems. Um, there really is no antidote for larkspur poisoning. Yeah. A Belvoir Ranch out here that the city owns now. Uh, they used to put <clears throat> sheep out there before they grazed the cattle. Mm -hmm. And that was just normal practice. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Just kind of knock down some of the weeds that the cattle can't deal with, but the sheep can. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, some other fun things in a mixed grass prairie, these are all the good guys. I, and I say good guys, prickly pear cactus, unless you fall on one, but they're they're abundant out there. Little barrel cactus, they're abundant out there. Scarlet globe mallow, little um, kind of a salmon orange color. Fringe sage, I know a lot of people look at fringe sage and go, what is it good for the artemisia? When I see a pasture that's nothing but fringed sage, it's been overgrazed. And fringe sage is a colonizer, and it will try to help that that pasture come back. But it's a it's a sign that it's been overgrazed. Phlox, so the hooded, so we have garden phlox and creeping phlox, but there's also a native phlox. Doesn't get very big. Whites, and again, Forbes is just another name for wildflowers. So when you look at antelope. And someone tells you they eat forbs, they eat wildflowers and native weeds. 
So they're they're really you know a good guy out there, the antelope. Prickly pear never gets very big. I see it more frequently on the west side of Cheyenne. And I've seen quite a bit of it up at Kirk Gowdy. But very pretty when the if flower blooms and there's a fruit underneath it, that fruit is very edible. If you ever have to get to that point where you're eating prickly pear cactus fruit. Scarlet globe mallow, really pretty. I've got a lot of it growing at my place. I encourage it. The seed cat, the prairie nursery, they should have seed for it or plants. Doesn't transplant well, it's got a taproot. Fringe sage, again, a lot of people, I get calls on how can I get rid of it? Don't mow and don't overgraze. You know, let your pasture rest. That's the only way you can get rid of it. Um, hooded phlox, this guy blooms early spring, April. It's gonna start blooming in April. Doesn't mind the snow. It's one of those first plants to bloom that supports the native pollinators. Hey, small mammals, rodents, rabbits, hares, prey dogs, pocket gophers, ground squirrels, and mice. Rabbits. <laughs> um, I get a lot of calls on these guys in the summer about how can I get rid of them? If you're out on the prairie, stop mowing. That's the answer, stop mowing. If you're in town, mow your lawn taller. You know, don't mow it two inches, but let it mow it, as, mow it four inches if you can. The taller you can let that lawn grow, the more you're gonna detour these guys. Um, yeah, that's some that's some cottontail damage there. 45 degree angle damage on those stems. That's a cottontail. Little nibbles off the side of the trunk. That's cottontail. 18 inch fence. It it depends. It depends upon the year. Remove brushy and weedy habitat. If you can let the native grasses grow and let them grow tall, that's gonna be your best deterrent for it. I have a lot of rabbits out at my place. Most domestic dogs can discourage rabbits, maybe, <laughs> maybe. And I put it that way, I have, I have five dogs. Three of them are corgis who think they need to herd everything. And the other two are Turkish Akbash, which think they need to protect everything. So, <laughs> But they all chase the rabbits and they'll run about 50 feet and then the dogs stop and go, yeah, okay. Because <laughs> they, they know they can't check, can't, they can't catch the rabbits, so they just give up. So that's why I say maybe. Tree guards, all my trees are protected because the rabbits will go after the bark on the trees and they'll girdle a tree in a heartbeat. So Protection on your trees is very important. How, how long do you like the protection on there until it's until that bark until it gets bark? As long as it's tender, soft cambium out there, they'll go after it. But once it starts to get corky, then the rabbits leave that alone. Yeah, they don't want to work any harder than they have to. Hairs. I don't, hair population comes and goes. I mean, that's very cyclical. So sometimes you'll see a lot of hairs, so the population's up here, then it drops. Mostly out on the prairie, there's big animals. They're, they're big. And again, I found at a friend's house out on the prairie, they had Jack Russell Terriers, and the Jack Russells wouldn't even chase them anymore. So that dogs can get really, dogs themselves can get discouraged by the rabbits. And so they give up. Again, don't know, let that, let that get tall so that they have to, if the animal has to see, if the animal can see over the grass, they're golden. It's when they can't see over that grass that they go, oh, I've got to move someplace that's, that's more 
protective for me. And so they want that mowed or overgrazed area. Same thing with prairie dogs. There's, there's a couple areas in, in Cheyenne and some very high end neighborhoods that are on acreage where they have just mowed it. They're you know, trying to make it look like a golf course and they've just mowed it to death. The prairie dogs have moved in. Prairie dogs are very destructive. Not a lot you can do. You, you can try poisoning them. You can try shooting them. You can try I, the list of things that people have done trying to get rid of prey dogs is hilarious. And if you <laughs> it, right down to pumping propane down their holes and lighting it off, <laughs> you know, <laughs> other than making a lot of noise, it still doesn't get rid of the prairie dogs because those holes are just huge and they go deep and they're extensive. They're all over the place. So once you know prairie dog group over here dies off, the prairie dog group over here goes, oh, home's available. And so they move their offspring that way. And so it's, it's hard. But again, a prairie dog, if you watch them, they're always sitting up, right, on their, their hills and they're looking around. They're watching for predators. And they love that open space where they have a huge vista but as soon as you, they lose that vista, as soon as the grass gets too tall for them to see over, they move on, they go away because it's no longer safe for them. Because they don't know if that fox, that weasel, that owl, whatever, is gonna come get them. So they move on. And I convinced one lady up in that neighborhood to stop mowing and her prairie dogs are starting to go away. And so we'll see what happens this year with all the moisture. But my bet is that if she leaves the prairie alone, lets it get tall, all those prairie dogs are going to go over to her neighbors and she'll have a whole free pasture. They don't hibernate, so they're active year round. Extensive, dense colonies. They will clip that grass. I've watched them prune bindweed down to an inch tall. The, the other problem with these guys, the prairie dogs and the ground squirrels, is that they bring some really bad characters with them. It's kind of like you get prairie dogs and then, and then the Harley, then the Hells Angels move in. And those are your rattlesnakes and your black widow spiders because they like prairie dog holes. And so if you go to a prairie dog hole or a ground squirrel hole and you look down in there, you're most likely going to start seeing spider webs. And if it really smells bad, it's probably snakes down in there too. Pocket gophers. These guys, again, they don't hibernate. They're active 24-7. They like cool moist soil. So if you're irrigating, and this is where trying to irrigate a, a windbreak row gets to be kind of challenging, because you actually want the irrigation on top of the black plastic or the black fabric. You don't want to create a real wet area underneath all that. You want to just water the tree only, because a pocket gopher likes that cool moist soil. That's their happy. And they will girdle the roots off of that tree and you end up with just this club. And then the tree falls over and you pick it up and there's no roots to it. So they're very, very destructive that way. This is what their tunnels look like. This is what it looks like, can look like in your, in a field or an over irrigated lawn. They're very, very hard to get rid of. Very hard. This is, they, they get in alfalfa fields, they get in corn fields, and you know, there's poison baits for them. The baits really are I'm kind of on the fence about them. I won't let my husband use the poison baits for them in our fields. And so he's just, it's a point of contention between the two of us because I don't want to, I don't want to kill off target animals. So that's the problem with using those poison baits. If you go to Murdoch's and buy, ground squirrel poison, but your risk is, you know, if someone's cat or dog or another wildlife digs up that dead animal, now they're getting that poison too. 
So I, I have some issues with that. This is what pocket gopher damage looks like. The roots are gone and it's just sort of this club, this thing. Domestic cats, hawks, owls. Um, I had a cat, a, a barn cat that would routinely go dig them up and bring them to me. <laughs> you know, mom, breakfast. <laughs> you know, well, thank you. I, I had one in my high tunnel that I saw. It, I saw these huge mounds in my high tunnel. It was like, oh. And then I realized that it was actually rototilling the soil for me, and I was, was kind of okay about that. Are they also known as voles? Different creature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different creature. Two different things. Ground squirrel doesn't look much different from a prairie dog, just smaller. They do hibernate, which is the good news. So you won't see them. So these are the guys that if you're out in the county, you know, all of a sudden this little squirrel pops up and runs across the road in front of you. Those are the ground squirrels. So their, their hole isn't going to have a mound of soil around it. It's just going to be a hole. That's about the size of it. Again, don't mow the grass. Let the, let the grass get tall. Best control of all, right there, the fox. Absolutely best control. If you've got a fox in your neighborhood, you're not going to have rabbit problems. You're not going to have pocket gopher problems, ground squirrel problems, because he's the best, hands down. So, that's the range. So, that's my lecture for tonight. I'm, uh, we'll see where Kim's at. So, maybe Wednesday night we'll have the fun flower class. Any questions, thoughts, comments? By now, you all should know that don't mow your prairie, right? Don't mow the prairie. Don't overgraze it. Hard, hard not to do sometimes. Okay, that's the extent for my lecture. Anybody on Zoom that's got questions? No, I'm glad I moved out of the county. <laughs> Well, there, there's a lot of, it, it's never dull out there, I tell you, my life is not dull. I actually had a ground squirrels eat 100 PSI poly pipe from my sprinkler system. Oh, geez, yeah. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it, but yeah, they ate right through the side of it. Yep, they'll, they'll eat wires too, buried wire. They'll, they'll eat that too. That's that's crazy. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah, have a good night.